Uh, David McAfee, uh, CVP and GM client, uh, computing and graphics business unit. Um, sure. Is is yeah, our, our CPU products. Yeah, sure. Ryzen, Ryzen CPU products. And Jason's Official. Jason's our VP and GM of uh, of our MNC business, yes. our OEM yeah. business. Okay. So yeah, there we then go. I, guys. That means I get to introduce Rakesh now. <laughs> yes, and we and have Rakesh. Rakesh leads AI product management for clients. So. Yes. So all, all software questions directed to Rakesh. All right, so let's, let's just start and recap a few things. I know we saw some of this yesterday, but just to go through it again, in this session, as a reminder, we are gonna be talking about client products specifically, so that endpoint end of the spectrum, I guess that's that end, endpoint end of the spectrum, uh, is what we're gonna focus on here. And I think maybe just to, to kick off with a couple of things, when we talk about Ryzen AI, and the way that we think about AI processing on Ryzen processors, it is the combination of all these different compute elements, XDNA for really low power, highly optimized inference processing, um, our Zen CPU cores for high throughput, low latency operations with all of the new instructions like VNNI and uh, AVX512 that have been added to the CPU in the Zen 4 generation. And then RDNA 3 graphics integrated, or RDNA 3 and, or beyond more generically, um, graphics in our APUs as well, which are really great for parallel processing for more wide um, throughput operations as well. You know, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, the what is the AI PC and, and why do we need an AI PC? I think you heard a lot of that today, right? We all believe that AI PC is going to be transformational to the user experience to personal productivity, to uh, the creator experience, and we believe that that means in order to enable that vision of the future, it requires a leap in performance and capability for inference processing. Uh, it requires you know, really a deep understanding of the security and privacy aspects of what it takes to deliver those local inference experiences, and then power efficiency is the other part of it. We want all of these experiences to be delivered on a laptop PC, and um, I don't think anybody wants to sacrifice their battery life in order to have all of these new experience, so efficiency is a key part of that as well. Um, you know, we, we've, we talked a little bit yesterday about our Ryzen AI adoption strategy. You know, step one, make the hardware available. That's with the, the Phoenix or the 7040 series platform. Uh, we have shipped millions of devices spanning consumer, commercial, um, all segments within that, including premium consumer devices, creator devices, gaming devices, all different form factors, all different configurations, spanning a broad range of price points. So the hardware is out there. It's in the hands of end users. And so that moves us on to how do we go build the ecosystem to make Ryzen AI an even more exciting and relevant um, uh, part of the purchase decision for that end user. Step one for us is work with the big ISVs. You saw uh, some of the highlights in the video today of companies like Topaz Labs and functions that we enable through Adobe and Blackmagic and others. That's a big part of, of where we kind of start that journey on enabling AI experiences on our client devices. Um, from there, then we go into what we're doing from a, a developer ecosystem standpoint today we're, we, uh, I think Ryzen AI software is live on our website. Uh, this is a tool that allows users to take a model that they get from Hugging Face or, or something that's in an open source framework like PyTorch or, or Onyx or, or others, uh, quantize it and um, pair it with Onyx to go execute on the Ryzen AI engine very quickly, very easily. The, the whole goal here is to make this a simple and intuitive experience for the developer such that it opens the door to lots of innovation and lots of new ideas uh, for how Ryzen AI is used and for how new models get onto uh, the NPU or the, the um, inference processing engine on our Ryzen AI processors. Um, last but not least, well, next to last but not least, Ryzen AI Developer Challenge announced about a week ago lots of different categories for um, what we're looking for. We partnered with Hackster to go enable this. And, and really the goal here is to reach the breadth of developers, right? The, the students, the enthusiasts, the, uh, the builders and makers that are all looking at AI as some incredibly new and interesting technology. 
giving away free hardware as a part of this, as well as prizes as a part of this contest. So you know, this is kind of the first step that we're taking to broaden the, the reach of Ryzen AI and get more and more developers excited about what they can do with Ryzen AI in their systems. And then last but not least, you heard Lisa today talk about the 8040 series. The next step in uh, our Ryzen roadmap, this will be available in market starting in Q1 of next year, shipping initial silicon to customers today as they start to ramp those systems. Again, we expect a wide portfolio of devices to be covered by this. It's got an enhanced uh, NPU engine with more tops than the current 7040 generation. Zen 4 CPU cores, RDNA 3 graphics, clicking through, clicking through. And then last but not least, Lisa also talked about our roadmap. Phoenix is in market today. We talked about Hawk Point a moment ago. Uh, Strix Point is the next generation. This will be coming in 2024. Next generation, XDNA 2 inference engine. And you know, this is, this is about really reaching a tipping point in terms of generative AI capability, as well as multitasking for inferencing workloads on that NPU. Uh, we expect this to provide more than 3x generative AI performance on the NPU. And so when you think about that journey of where we're going and what we want to enable in next-gen experiences, Strix Point is a huge leap forward in terms of capability and, um, and possibility for what our next generation processors will be. So with that, um, I think we'll stop and open it up to any questions that people might have. So my question is from the perspective of uh, uh, Ryzen AI PCs. Uh, one is how do they uh, compare to uh, some of the existing uh, PCs like the Apple ones and one and uh, two. The second question is around the democratization of it, right? Uh, one is uh, you are saying that there is a lot of initiatives that you are taking up with regards to you know hosting a hackathon through Hackster or getting the developers excited. Uh, but uh, overall, if you see, uh, you know, Apple and Intel, these kind of things are more household names and they are advertised very strongly. So, what is the kind of go-to market strategy to kind of, uh, you know, uh, penetrate uh, developers to kind of get excited among uh, these folks to use as No, it, it, so uh, great, great, great questions. I'll, I'll start with the first one. Um, just the the reaction we're getting to Ryzen AI PCs, which we launched earlier this year, CES this year, we launched our first uh, Ryzen AI, the 7040. Um, you know, so the, the OEM adoption has been great. They've, uh, they've picked it up. Uh, we're seeing it in more and more systems across gaming, content creation. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of the cutting edge premium systems have, have picked that up. And we've gotten a lot of great feedback on the performance, um, not, not just how it compares to our prior generations, but compared to other offerings out there. So, Great feedback on compute performance, graphics performance, gaming performance, and then the Ryzen AI, which is, it's you know it's it's an emerging workload. There's still you know still uh, more and more applications taking advantage of this, so it's it's new. And as David mentioned earlier, we're putting a lot of the hardware out there, and then a lot of the applications and and use cases are emerging quickly from there. But the hardware has to be there first. So we're seeing great response to that. Um, and you know, we've had conversations with Microsoft about how many people are using this, how it's being um, utilized in the system, and we're getting great feedback as to how that's ramping. On your second question about Ryzen AI and it being picked up by you know, more, more of a household name, our goal there is to really make it easy and um, you know, make that adoption straightforward. So a lot of what we've talked about with uh, the AI software, this, the, the 1.0 that released today, it's really to make that a one-click install. Uh, made it, uh, I've, I've used it myself, which if, if, if I can do it, then you know, most, most folks can do it. Um, but I've used it myself. And it's, it's to make it a one-click install to make it very familiar uh, to people that are looking to develop um, models and deploy models into the endpoint, into the PC. And by, by doing that and, and, and making that easy from an, uh, an install perspective, making it accessible, because it's, AI's, it, it comes across as a bit intimidating today, you know, not, not everybody's familiar with it. Yeah. So making that easy is, is key. And then also having a good library of models out there. You know, there's, there's you know, large, um, you know, uh, I would say a, 
you know, we call it this model zoo or this, this library of models that's out there on hugging face, et cetera, making it possible to quantize those models, get them running on a PC, it makes it that much more accessible because you can get started on something that already exists. So you don't have to, to learn everything from scratch. So combining that ease of, as well as what's already out there in the ecosystem, I think is gonna make it a lot more accessible to people that are just starting with Ryzen AI and, and trying to see what it can do from a developer perspective. I'll, I'll add something to that. I mean, I think that one of, one of the really unique uh, positions that AMD has, given everything that you heard at today's event, is just the breadth of coverage we have in the ecosystem from you know, data center to enterprise, like cloud data center, enterprise services, all the way down to endpoint devices and kind of everything in between, right? And so um, we may be unmatched by anybody else in the industry who has that same breadth of coverage when it comes to AI technology and how we're bringing unique and innovative solutions to each of those spaces. And so I think one of the attractions that AMD will have with developers is, is absolutely that, right? That range of whether you're targeting an endpoint device or looking for something that scales from endpoint up to cloud or, or kind of anything in between, we're one of the very few companies in the ecosystem with a software stack that has um, you know, continuity in the software stack as well that allows a developer to kind of address that end-to-end -end range of solutions. And I think that's a really unique value proposition for AMD right now. Yeah, I think the, the, more from the perspective of like, uh, you have the product, like everybody's sold on it. It's just more from the perspective of making it a household name, like it mm -hmm. is or uh, this is, which probably is. Uh, my follow-up question to David Liu will be probably with regards to, uh, you know, this this is more of a bottom-up approach, right? With going through Hackster and, you know, hosting hackathons, getting uh, developer advocacy, you know, improving developer advocacy. From a top-down approach, are you partnering with a few companies to kind of ensure that, you know, your, uh, your uh, Ryzen AIPC is used so to kind of build AIML modules um, I don't know if you have a ready answer for yeah, that I mean, one. Or, no, we, yeah. we are. It's, so it's, I would, I would split our um, ecosystem enablement strategy into three, three key pieces. A big piece is Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft as um, the first application that's using this, um, more and more operating system applications. The first piece is, is, is Microsoft, and we're, as you saw today, we're, we're very deeply partnered with them. Um, the second piece is the, the larger software providers um, that are doing content creation. Um, you, we, you've seen some of the, uh, we, we've shown some of the, to, as, as, you know, from a, a messaging perspective, as well as a implementation of the software, what we've done with Adobe, uh, what we've done with Topaz Labs. A lot of these applications, you know, the, the, the larger software suites that are out there in the industry, we're not just sending them the software and saying, good luck, we're, we're partnering hand in hand with them. Our engineering teams are working together to make sure that, um, that it works well, first of all, but also that when those features are enabled, and there's a, a lot of AI enabled features already today in you know, Adobe, Adobe Suites, DaVinci, all these other applications, not only are those enabled, but you can, you know, you, you can enhance the performance of that solution if that is, a, uh, a workflow you use or an application you use, you can enhance the performance of that by using the Ryzen or Ryzen AI solution. Uh, so there's a deep partnership with those with those key ISVs, and then the third piece is this more broader enablement, uh, which is what we're doing with you know the hackathons and getting the the software, making it turnkey for developers. So the Microsoft piece is very key. These big software partners that we're working with deeply and making sure that it, it works well with our hardware. And then finally, the broader enablement for the ecosystem. All three of those are going to be very critical toward, to, to driving wide adoption of what we think is a great solution from an AI hardware perspective. Okay, I think we had Good one here in the front row first. Okay, so uh, I think also, you know, uh, your company, uh, like uh, Qualcomm, in general, has a uh, middle layer uh, that's about a CPU, GPU, NPU, so from software side. So, could you give me a your side is the same middleware is there, so in a AI, Ryzen, uh, Ryzen AI so software. So if you have any information for that? It looks like uh, we have a phone <laughs> friend here. 
Somebody you, else you, middle of your it. question, he jumped up. So I was like, I think Rakesh has got the answer. <clears throat> yeah, so you know, the GA release that we have of the Ryzen AI software one that does exactly that. It takes a workload, it splits it onto our NPU and CPU. We have a separate path for the GPU as well. And you'll see more from us as and when we mature the software and we have more releases of that, there will be going to be more enhancements to that whole middleware. The ultimate goal is to have the required workload run on the right accelerator so that the end user gets the required experience. It can be better performance, it can be better battery life, right? That's been the design philosophy in our software. Yeah. I think uh, you know, uh, Microsoft Direct ML is uh, pretty much important for, you know, especially for developers because, you know, uh, pretty similar to uh, DirectX uh, for gaming. So, you know, this is a, uh, you know, a Direct ML for, you know, uh, AI application developer. So, could you give me a uh, you are support for direct ML or you are licensing AI software? Yeah, I mean, direct ML is actually a very key component. Mm -hmm. We have been working very closely with Microsoft and, you know, also on some of the key next generation workloads, right? Like Stable Diffusion and Llama. So we are working very closely with them so that the direct ML works very well with the Verizon AI to get the best performance possible. Yeah, I think Intel has an open you know, EP for support, you know, uh, they are, you know, Direct ML from Direct ML API to their open you know, uh, layer to under also NPU. So, it's, do you do you have a same uh, you know architecture for? Yes, absolutely. I think the general philosophy is we want to give options to our users at the same time extract the best performance out of our hardware, right? DirectML is a perfect example. Supporting DirectML helps us get that scale, working closely with Microsoft, you know, integrates directly into applications and stuff. And you know, we can also use different options to get maximum performance out of our system. So absolutely, yes. And another question for uh, for David. So you know, at this time you have also you know, AD forty. So uh, is a um, a disclosing. So but uh, you know you have also seventy fifty you know seventy thirty you know, in mm -hmm. in this generation. So could you give me a more detail about you know uh, you know uh, next gen of a seventy fifty seventy thirty still so continuing. So you know uh, in the next. Um, I'll say the short answer is no. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about other future products today. Today we're specifically focused on how our AI roadmap advances over the next generation. And as we get into 2024, we'll be talking to you more about how the rest of our roadmap progresses. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Alex. Yes, Alex. Uh, I just sort of uh, wanted to follow up more or less on the question that I asked yesterday. It's really great that you're doing the developer um, competition and the uh, hackathon. and. Uh, you've got great partners, and you've got Microsoft itself. And um, but I, I could just see that um, you know the, the missing part of the equation in all of this is the actual end user, be it the consumer or the, the business person. And obviously they're not forgotten because that's who you're telling to. That's who's using it. But all of this also needs to have input from the end users. And if you don't do it, then Intel and Microsoft will do it. You should be on the front foot to have some sort of competition that, I don't know, ask little kids like they used to in the 50s about what life would be like in the year 2000. How, they, how do they see AI being used? How, do, how does the end user at home or the business person see themselves? Like, get them to imagine what they can do with this AI-powered um, processor and they can be running a chat GPT on their computer, not just in the cloud. I mean, already Qualcomm and, and um, uh, uh, Google talk about their chips, their next generation chips, or the current generation being able to do all that on device. That's only going to become more and more uh, common as we have, you know, it's like you can have uh, voice transcription used to be in the cloud, now it's on device. It's going to be exactly the same thing for AI. And uh, so I, I, I'm thinking all these things are great, but you should also be, I'm always thinking of the consumer, the end user. Engage them directly. I mean, Intel Inside was a wonderful way, just to have back to this gentleman's uh, thing about how it's a, it's a brand name. And there is no AMD Inside sort of thing. And, mm -hmm. and there should be, there should be something. And it should be flavored around AI, and you should have some giant competition. Uh, and do it before Intel does, and get Microsoft's help, and get you know Lenovo's help, and HP's help, and do it. I, I think I, I did. I did offer Alex a marketing job yesterday. So. I didn't know you had a rec open. Okay, I, don't know, that's cool. I don't. We just we made that work. But I, I think you're absolutely right. There there is um, there are more opinions about what AI can do for pick your user and, and pick what they do in a given day, then we could probably possibly count right now. And I, you know, one of the things that um, Lisa said during the keynote today that really stuck out to me is just, like if you think about it, GPT first came onto the scene a year ago. And just like think about how much, 
has changed in a year. Like it's absolutely mind boggling. It's not just like it's beyond exponential growth that has occurred over the past 12 months. And like I am sure that you could you could ask end users what they think AI will do, but you know, everybody's gonna be maybe partially right and partially wrong and, and the the real possibility of, of what it what it could be and what it will be will um, you know be somewhere in the middle there. But I, I think you're totally right. The the end user um, definitely needs a voice in all of this. It, you know, we we work very closely with our OEM partners, with our software partners, trying to understand their vision uh, as we talk to customers about products as well, capturing where they want to go and where where they see their customers wanting to go with these products. But you're right; it, it is something that the public, uh, the end consumer, also is uh, in, and needs to be deeply engaged in. Directly yep. at every Best mm -hmm. Buy, Harvey Norman, in all those places that there are AMD laptops and desktops on sale, there needs to be a little sticker with scan me this QR code to enter the AMD AI competition that's going to blow your socks off. And obviously yep. you have to come up with something better than that, but you can do it. All right. Use AI's yeah. help to All right. create the perfect campaign. We, we have our, our client marketing lead okay. three rows behind you there. <laughs> He's scribbling notes furiously. You, you wrote down QR code. Yeah, content. Okay, good, yeah. good, good. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Next, yes. Yeah. The Ryzen AI software that uh, from yesterday someone uh, asked about the the supporting uh, of Ryzen AI. Uh, right now, I think uh, I, I, my understanding is Ryzen AI is supporting only on Windows. Uh, I'm wondering that uh, because of the many developers uh, using Linux or mm -hmm. Mac OS to develop its applic uh, their own applications, uh, why? I, 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 I'm wondering why why Ryzen AI does not support uh, Linux right now or no plan. <laughs> I think the Linux support strategy is pretty important. We are actively working on it. You'll hear more from us in early 2024 about Ryzen AI support in Linux. So it's not forgotten. It's definitely on a roadmap. It's coming soon. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, how about this side? Oh, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, you know, the LLM is very hot nowadays. But, uh, many people think it's just like the networks a few years ago. Uh, it will cool down in one or two years. Uh, Paul, what do you think about it? Uh, can you, can you the, repeat the like, like, so, so like LLMs. Uh, yeah, is it, is it going to... Is it a fad? Is it a fad? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. okay, we'll, we'll I, do a panel here. You go yeah, first, Yeah, I, I can go on. <laughs> I, I, uh, <laughs> um, I, I think there is, there is a lot of energy right now, but I, I don't see this being a fad. Um, because it's, I mean, you, you, you talked about you know metaverse and how it you know it, it was there was a lot of excitement and then you know cooled off a little bit. What we're seeing with LLMs right now is just more and more and more exploration and more you know it, it came up in the, the keynote today. We're seeing that it can do. Th I mean, it was it started out largely. I mean, the original um, you know uh, papers that that. You know, started this wave. It was largely around language translation. It mm -hmm. was that was you know the, the key use case, and then it expanded into you know broader assistance, and then it's expanded into you know content generation, and it just it just keeps evolving, and people are finding new ways to utilize this for productive applications, things that um, you know assist from a life perspective. They're finding all these 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 ways that you can use this that they hadn't thought about before. So the level of exploration keeps going, you know, keeps moving, and so it's not like this one, you know, moment where ChatGPT came out and then everybody's, you know, waiting to see what's next. What's next is already happening. It continues to happen. So I, I don't see it. Um, you know, will 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 there be you know kind of peaks in excitement and you know new new discoveries y yes that's going to happen but uh, I, I don't see this as something that's going to fade very quickly I mean it's it's um, uh, I, I think it is more of a chain you know a, a paradigm change mm -hmm. in how we do compute uh, both at the endpoint as all, all the way up through the cloud yeah I'll, I'll build on that I, I think that what we see today with LLMs is sort of a glimpse into the future right and if, if you take a step back, what, for the past 50 plus years, the interaction between a person and a PC has been through a keyboard and a mouse. <laughs> and I think that 
LLMs offer the possibility to transform the way that we interact with our PCs. It could be through speech. It could be through having more of a conversation with your PC where it understands you, what you're asking, the context of what you're asking it to do, and gives you a more intelligent and, and honestly appropriate response. I mean, I think about the number of tasks that I do on my PC on a daily basis that are you know, repetitive, that are easily automated, yet because it's all dominated by keyboard and mouse, I've got to do it all myself. And that could be reorganizing files, that could be cleaning up my inbox, that could be lots of different things. Um, but I think that the ability to have, you know, through LLMs as maybe a vehicle to create a better uh, human machine interface model creates a world of possibilities. Once you get an AI assistant that truly understands you and your data and your habits and you know, the ways that you operate, I think that there are some really exciting possibilities how LLMs fit into a much bigger role that AI plays in the future. Uh, you know, the problem, the media tech, uh, they are all talking about the AI, especially the AI on device. So what do you think of the difference between PC AI and uh, smartphone AI? Uh, what's the advantage of PC AI? Thank you. I mean, I think, I think um, the way they operate and you know the way they work. There's there's similarities um, between you know neural processing in a smartphone, neural processing in the PC, neural processing uh, inferencing in the cloud. Uh, it's very similar operationally, but what's really different is the form factor in which you find PCAI. So having that neural capability and having that inferencing capability on device. The PC has, is generally more of a productive device. Um, you know, the phone, you, there's, there's a lot of uh, handsets, there's a lot of consumption, interaction, communication, collaboration. Uh, but one of the things that makes PC very unique is, it is it's a very popular device for productivity. And having that AI capability combined with that productivity device really unlocks a lot of new experiences that, you know, whether it's you know, content generation um, you know, commu uh, different forms of communication, things you, you do every day on a PC, and as, as David mentioned before, is very manual. Um, you know, it requires interaction with your eyes, your hands, et cetera, uh, to, to make that happen. Now having that neural processing in the PC, you can, you can do a lot of those product productive tasks uh, that you couldn't do before. So while, you know, the way the neural processors work, um, there's similarities, the end use or that, that, that uh, form factor that that device, you know, combining it with that really unlocks a, new, a lot of new experiences that we're going to see. I, I, just to add, I think the smartphone there's there's a there's an emphasis on audio, video, app, AI for that, and on the PC. While we have that as well, you're going to see more AI as it pertains to uh, pro productivity and content creation. Can you bring the uh, the AI PPO to the desktop, right? So we, we're not talking about other markets that we're bringing AI into today. Um, like I said, we'll talk about future roadmap and uh, more more plans as we get into 2024. So as we start making Skynet become a reality, you know, <laughs> this problem that I'm, I'm not sure if we can give it to the right uh, <laughs> Can you cite an example or scenario where a game developer can make it of rather AI and or LLM to enrich or enhance the game with be rich? Mm. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I think we're seeing um, more exploration of that. Um, so, I mean, we're, it's, it's still early, but I mean, the, the, there are ways that um, AI language generation, whether it's interaction with characters in a game, NPCs, et cetera, um, for that experience to be, it's today that experience is, it's the same experience every time you play, and it's the same experience for everyone who plays. And being able to generate, because there's, uh, you know, most LLM, that, that content is, you, if you ask it the same question five times, you get five different answers, um, you, you get a uniqueness that, that exists um, in that LLM, and you can get a uniqueness in that game. 
Um, so that is, you know, that is uh, one place where we're seeing exploration of LLMs and AI and gaming. Um, the other, the other key um, element to it, you know, map creation, uh, elements like that. That, again, if uh, map, you know, uh, map design or map creation is is very uniform uh, to each gaming experience and to each gaming user. But if map creation, if you know, if you went into a new map and you're very, you know, if, if uh, you know, if you're used to, you know, uh, Dust 2 and CSGO or something like that, it's the same map every time. But if AI map generation were able to create a unique experience to make the game more fun to explore or more challenging for a user, that, that could be an application. Mm -hmm. And then just, you know, visual enhancement, you know, being able to enhance resolution is, is another uh, avenue of exploration for uh, for AI and AI hardware in the PC. So there's a lot of avenues. It's still very early. People are just starting to explore this more. But uh, we're partnered with the gaming community, the developer community, to to look at ways to to take advantage of this in the in the PC. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one more question from the China first, please. Uh, uh, Dr. Earth. Uh, so currently, can you please uh, recommend more applications that can support Ryzen AI? It means the uh, specific applications that can support Ryzen AI currently. The first one, for example, Adobe Series. Uh, which kind of uh, applications from Adobe Series or which kind of uh, function uh, of the Adobe can be uh, adopted by the Ryzen AI or Ryzen can support kind of uh, function from Adobe? And also, you would, you would suggest us to uh, text Ryzen AI through what kind of uh, approach? Uh, in addition, if you have any plans to support stable diffusion in the future, uh, I'll rewind. Um, oh, did I go past it? Sorry. You went too far. I went too far. So, so maybe just a place to start. You know, if you look at where we are today with the software ecosystem across Photoshop, Premiere Pro, After Effects, uh, Lightroom, DaVinci, Blackmagic, there there are a number of functions, and it's. You know, what you typically see is in these applications, it's not just the, the basic functions, it's the more advanced capabilities that are being built into these applications where AI really helps, right? The smart select features or when you're editing a video, performing an operation in one frame and then having the AI carry that through many frames is really where this, the AI technology brings such an advantage to Again, making these really complex, repetitive tasks simpler for somebody who's a content creator. So I think this is a great start. Uh, I would also say that we are deeply engaged across a, a number of ISVs in the ecosystem to broaden this even further. And I think you'll see this list grow very rapidly as we go through 2024 and beyond. Okay. So to answer your question, the question was, are all of where where are these experiences running? Uh, what I would say is if you look at this list today, it, it's a mix. There are some that run on the MPU. There's some that run on the GPU. There's some that run on the CPU. And every software developer is at a different stage in their, um, I guess, maturity or optimization of different AI functions in their application. Over time, as those AI functions become more complex, more pervasive, and demand you know, more, more power or, or demand more efficiency, um, we expect those software developers to migrate those functions into the right accelerator in the chip. So kind of like Rakesh talked about where you have you know, a software layer that helps create a more universal interface for the developer, our expectation is over time, each of these things land on the right accelerator for the outcome that that software developer is looking for. Yeah. Yes. We're waiting for like companies like Microsoft, the software company, to launch better solution or product of the AI. So, uh, how do you see this, and uh, when do you think the AI PC market will actually uh, significantly uh, grow? So we're we're seeing. So we released our first AI PCs this year. Um, we're getting great adoption. So as as uh, Lisa mentioned, in the keynote, we're seeing millions of. Uh, devices being, um, you know, being par purchased by end users. Uh, some of that's because we've got great performance for content creation, gaming, um, et cetera. And some of some folks are looking to understand 
uh, what they can do with an AI PC. So some of that's happening already. Um, as far as applications, you know, we're seeing uh, a big wave of that coming in 2024. And to your point, some of that that'll create adoption and, and refresh in 2024. So we're we're already getting signals from end customers, from our partners that. Uh, 2024, we'll see growth in, in adoption for AI PCs. And then 2025, we're expecting that to, to go even faster. Uh, so, a, you know, a bigger uptick in, in growth. And m a lot of that's because those, those you know, those, those killer applications um, or those, those use cases are going are gonna to pick up steam um, in, in 2024. So I, I, I tend to agree that 2024, we're going to see some of it. 2025, we're going to see a lot more. But just to no. follow, I was say, presumably also people who are buying the 7040 and the 8040 series chips now, when 2025 rolls around, they actually have operating systems and software that can much more easily take advantage of that existing, potentially at the moment, underused capability. So that'll be a boost for those people. And then, of course, when they upgrade to <coughs> third, fourth, fifth, or sixth yeah. generation processes with AI, well, we'll just be in a whole different universe. Yeah, we're, we're actually, um, one of the things we, we're wanting to do with our AI PCs, so 7040 systems or 8040 systems, even that install base that exists today, those end users, um, we really want to communicate to that community, hey, you, you bought this thing because it could do all these, this, you know, this cool stuff, whether it's, it's gaming or Windows Studio effects, et cetera. Now, as we bring LLMs into the new software release, now you can do all this extra stuff. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to buy a new, PC, now that you've bought a 7040, 8040, et cetera, um, you don't have to buy a new PC to deliver those experiences. So there is a bit of you know, buying that AI PC because not just of the applications that exist today, but those ones coming around the corner. I have a detailed question. It's about the Ryzen AI. Uh, from the press release, I, I, I read uh, uh, that uh, Ryzen AI is a software platform, but in the slide, it shows that uh, it's only software. I'm not sure. Uh, how, how can I? Communicate to the, the consumer that it's a platform to using any uh, any uh, platform in, in any uh, PC or is it just a software on Windows. Uh, it, it so it is. Um, so you, you want to take? There was a taxonomy change. Like, you know, we had beta release versions of our software. If you see our headline was Ryzen AI software platform. You know, from, from some marketing inputs, we are calling it software now. Yeah. But it's just a taxonomy change. But from an applicability, you can pick up the software, run on any Ryzen AI enabled PCs, and it would run. But would, would it run, for example, on an Intel PC with their AI chip, or is it AMD only? No, it's AMD only. If you look at underneath, it's our execution provider, which is specific to our core. So it runs on AMD so platform. No, I think that was oh, okay, that was yeah. Yeah. gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what kind of uh, uh, what do you expect? Uh, what kind of uh, you know application to be killer application like uh, Copilot in Microsoft 365? So you know, or uh, so you know, uh, content creation like Adobe. So or uh, the other you know, uh, you know uh, chat application blah blah blah. So in a short term and long term. I, my killer application is the email autoresponder that reads all my emails and responds to the 90% of the things that um, that would be very helpful. And then I only have to read a few emails every day, and it gives me a summary of everything that people want me to know. That would be my killer application. How about you, Jason? What's what's yours? <laughs> I, I want, so mine is a, a, an application that sends you emails every day. <laughs> And get, get, gets around all of your your, your applications. We had a great demonstration though today of why we urgently need an AI personalized translation application that can work in real time and uh, across all languages because um, that would be very very helpful. That that would be yeah. very helpful. Re real time translation in uh, in in meetings and video conferences would be, I, I think, truly a killer application that would transform the way that. People work together, and companies work together across the world. Um, that would be that would be truly an unprecedented change. We, we have it already yeah. with organic intelligence, OI, like human translators. Mm -hmm. But AI would be much faster. It would be. Yeah, it would be. <laughs> okay. Very good. Oh, one more back here. Um, so, I don't, uh, could you, could you share more about the, the definition of the AI PC? I know you just uh, <laughs> answered a similar questions before, but uh, 
is there any standards with, uh, you know, will be used in the future, like how many parameters you can be run on the AIPC or how many hops will support mm -hmm. anything like that? Yeah, I think, I think um, AIPC right now is a term. I mean, we're uh, PCs that have this AI capability in them. Um, but the definition of that and what capability is, is required is really going to be defined by those, those applications as they emerge. And today, we, you know, we, we've got um, studio effects. It can, it can run on 7040 series. It can run on 8040 series. Um, that next wave of applications, and right, and right now, you're, there's, there's still more capability in our Ryzen AI solution than, than what that application can use. We can still deliver more uh, AI apps. Now, as these next wave of applications emerge, standards are going to emerge with them. You know, you need you know this uh, token rate, this um, you know this amount of tops. Th those things are going to, I would say, emerge and then also stabilize. Um, you know, in, in the industry, I think you know we're we're as uh, you know as, uh, Lisa and, and uh, Pavan were joking about today. There's you know there is this demand for more tops uh, to to deliver those experiences, and it's a very real. Uh, thing. So there's, there's a partnership with, with Microsoft as, as an ecosystem leader to, to make sure that um, you know, we're, we're uh, working with, uh, aligning with those latest uh, standards, but then also all the other ISVs in the industry partnering with them as well. So as those applications emerge, those requirements are going to be, become much more clear uh, for, for what you need to have um, AIPC now, AIPC later. All right. With that, I think we are we are at time. Uh, everybody will need to transition to a new room. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for your questions. Enjoyed it.